First up, we have Gennaro Tedesco. He will share how he has built CML into his workflows at Billy.io to automate processes and save time. So um, also he created a NeoVim plugin for DVC that I will put into the um, chat. I'll put in the link to the chat. And that's also in our awesome iterative projects repo that I'll also share in the chat. So um, with that, the floor is yours and I will let Gennaro get started. First of all, again, um, I'll be introducing myself. My name is Gennaro Tedesco and I am a tech lead at Billy. Um, we are a Berlin-based company that deal with um, factoring for business. So um, in a nutshell, we lend money to merchants and to other companies whenever they need liquidities. And today I'm going to discuss some use cases that we have in our company and how and why we felt the need to integrate a solution like, um, like CM CML, starting from some examples. And then I will guide you through more or less the way we um, build uh, the GitHub Actions with particular emphasis on how to do this for private repositories, because um, although the documentation that the guys have in place is very, very thorough, there were some details that um, I had to uh, look up myself on how to set up all the repository secrets and all the secret accesses when you work with a private organization. And although, of course, this is information that you can Google by yourself, I thought, why Googling it if you can just copy and paste from my presentation? <laughs> Um, so yeah, I will be illustrating some use cases and then um, we'll go through um, some examples. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let's um, let's just start and let's illustrate the problem that we uh, we are trying to solve at Billy. Um, so as I said, um, at Billy we do factoring, which means we have to loan money to other companies. And you can well understand that in the process of factoring and loaning money, there is a lot of financial risk that is involved. So the Department of Data Science is tasked with assessing, for example, um, all defaulting probabilities of this particular customer, fraud detection to make sure that all the payments that come in place are legal payments. So there is a, an entire universe of making sure that the money that come in and out our company are legal and we don't lose them. And in order to do so, we have a few machine learning models in place. And these machine learning models use as input data the bank transactions of our customers. So ideally, we use the bank transactions in order to predict this or that other thing. And you can imagine that, of course, in most of these cases, you deal with text data or with data that can be naturally embedded to result into very, very high dimensional models. The problem with this is that, um, of course, you can build uh, your uh, extremely um, super duper state of the art machine learning model made of high dimensional data using all the most recent techniques of natural language processing and all the rest. But at some point you will need to train this bloody machine learning model. And usually there are two ways to do so. Either you train it on your local computer, which means that your local computer is um, unusable, um, or what most uh, organizations do is um, they use cloud services in order to train um, high dimensional models, which means that you have to usually log into this particular cloud service. You have to log in with your credentials. You have to spin up a new instance. You have to install all dependencies, and then eventually you have to shut it down. And I myself didn't want to um, really um, concentrate very much on the entire infrastructure part. So I was looking for a solution that helped me uh, somehow abstract away all the infrastructure part, and I wanted to concentrate on the data science. So I wanted to integrate a solution that, first of all, integrates very well with maybe GitHub Actions, GitHub Workflows, because I can integrate this with my daily um, GitHub routine. Uh, I wanted something that gave me the opportunity to spin up some cloud instances via GitHub Actions. And I also wanted something that uh, integrates very well with all the DVC infrastructure that we have in place, the storages, the pipelines, the experiments, and all the rest. 
And CML does just that. So CML is exactly the ultimate solution that fulfills all these um, these three points. And uh, funny story is that initially I didn't even realize that you guys were developing CML, and I was just googling for this type of solution. I was redirected to the CML website, and then I realized it was you guys. So uh, it wasn't on purpose initially. <laughs> So in the following presentation, I'm going to walk you through the setup that we are using at Pili with particular focus, as I said, on how to set up credentials and secrets for private repositories, virtual environments, especially for Python and all the interaction between Git and DVC. And eventually, if you have access to my slides, uh, all I'm going to say is essentially um, available on this uh, GitHub G, so you can literally copy and paste uh, the code that is there. You can um, put it in your own repositories, and it will work mutatis mutandis. So um, I will be writing together with you the CML uh, GitHub Actions workflow with the following structure. So, we have a YAML file, a workflow that triggers on some sort of events. We can say, for example, whenever you open a pull request, and we will be writing different types of jobs. Initially, of course, you want to deploy some cloud runners. Then you want to train the model. And what I'm going to show is how to fill the dots in here. So how to uh, set up deploy runner, how to set up um, credentials for training models and so on. And again, if you have access to, um, to the slide deck eventually, whenever you see this symbol here, you can uh, basically click Gennaro. and you will be redirected to the... Um... Uh, Gennaro, can you hear me? It doesn't seem that the slides are, are, are transferring, are moving. Uh, the, it's I'm... not changing slides. What slides are you seeing? Just the first one. Just the first one. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Um, probably I am sharing the wrong screen. Or can you see the slides moving now? Uh, try to change them. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I I apologize, guys. Sorry, I was going through um, uh, through the deck and for some reason. I don't know. I was full screen or so. Uh, but okay. Let let me resume. Um, where I was. So can you see this slide here now? Yes. This is what I was discussing. So we will be writing together with this um, uh, GitHub Actions workflow YAML file. And I will be filling in the dots here, how to deploy the runners, how to train the model. And whenever you see um, this icon here, you will be clicking um, and redirecting to the corresponding documentation either on GitHub or in general on Google. So, um, again, as I said, you will be most likely working with a private organization, which means that you need to allow the runners to um, access your uh, secret GitHub repositories. First things first, you have to set up a personal access token and granted repository and organizational access. Uh, this is used by the checkout actions in order to be able to um, clone the repository on the instances that you will be operating on. Secondly, um, as we said, you most likely want to um, avoid exposing your private data to general um, Ubuntu GitHub runners, and you want to have a layer of um, private security when you spin up whatever cloud instance you are using to make sure that the data that you are exposing to the internet are secured behind whichever credential um, your own repository or your organization is using. This means that um, you have to set up environment variables during the uh, stage of deploying the runner that contains um, whatever access credentials your cloud service is making use of. In our particular case, we are using AWS E2 instances, and you have to usually generally set up key ID and access ID, and you have to pass these variables as environment variables before you action with the CML runner. So together with the personal access token, to um, to make sure that um, the git um, sorry the the git action can pull your code you also have to introduce secrets for your cloud services in order to spin up the instance on those particular cloud services 
In order to be able to, again, a git pull and git push from within your private instance on the cloud, you must set up either SSH access or whichever other type of um, token access you're making use of. This is because after you finish the runs, you also maybe want to be able to push the code artifacts or in our particular case, the DVC training artifacts to, um, uh, to the corresponding cloud storage. Or in case, for example, your GitHub action does some modification to the code, you want to be able to push the code to the head of the uh, of the corresponding branch. So in order to do so, you have to allow um, for SSH access. And important to notice here is that your private key, your private SSH key must be copied as repository secret that then you have to call as environment variable. And the corresponding public part of your SSH key pair must become the GitHub deployment key. So even here, if you click on the link, you will be redirected to the corresponding documentation on the GitHub page, which will make sure that you know um, where to put all of this. Um, there is a very nice grammar um, uh, that you can use in GitHub Actions YAML files. Essentially, whenever you use a particular action, you can specify with this with statement which type of variables uh, you want to call from the environment. And in general, this is the uh, most practical way to do it. Uh, you also have to introduce this GitHub head reference in order to make sure that um, the push happens to the head that is at that moment checked out on the private instance. Then in our case, um, we tend to work with big projects that very often have many dependencies. And sometimes we have cases where we have the same package, which is called by different projects, and it may be using different version of the same package. To make a long story short, what I want to say is that very often we have to confine all our um, shells into um, virtual environments in order to avoid the different projects or different calls may um, interact with different versions of the packages and so on. So what we do is we use, uh, in our particular case, pipenv to manage Python environments, but there are also other solutions. There is poetry. There are also a few more that I don't remember the names of. And um, for pipenv and Python, um, there are um, ad hoc uh, actions that can help you specify, for example, the Python version that you want to use or the pipenv version that you want to use. And you don't even need to install these dependencies uh, via, for example, apt-get or whichever other ways you are usually installing Python or virtual environment dependencies when you use Docker files or any other containers. So this set of GitHub Actions help you remove this layer too, and you can just easily specify the version that you need and then um, directly call pipenv in order to create um, a virtual environment. Once you have everything set up in place, which means once you have spin up your cloud instances making use of um, your credentials in the way that I mentioned before, you are ready to execute your, your DVC pipeline. So you have your instances pinned up with security accesses, you have all your Python um, and um, virtual environments in place. Now you're ready to, um, of course, uh, reproduce the model. And this is uh, the nice part where um, using the CML container ensures that you already have all the DVC niceties in place. So you can just DVC pull from whichever remote you're storing your data, and then you can DVC repro, or you can use whichever other experiments or DVC uh, flow um, your repository makes use of. So this part here is already included in the um, CML container. In case you wanted to use different solution, different GitHub actions, you would have to additionally install DVC on those containers. And this layer is uh, taken away by the fact that we are using CML. Eventually, after the uh, experiments finish, you want to be able, of course, to commit the model artifacts. And this is the way you do it. So you have to um, tell um, Git explicitly that you are setting up some particular user credentials on these particular instances. To be honest, I think that uh, this is just 
uh, some cumbersome way that at the moment GitHub Actions are working. I believe that this could be uh, removed, but this is independent of what we do. And on CML, this is just uh, for Git to configure the users on the GitHub Actions. I think it's very stupid that you still have to do so, but this is another matter. And then, of course, uh, you git push and you DVC push so that your artifacts are already um, uploaded on the um, on whichever storage you are making use of. Another very nice thing that uh, that you can do with CML is that eventually, at the end of all this adventure, you can produce. Uh, beautiful metric reports and quantitative reports that automatically appear in your pull request. And this is one of the actually most useful things that, um, that CML puts at your disposal. This is extremely useful when you want to communicate data, for example, with the business, when you want to communicate data to your boss. Eventually, you just open a pull request. The GitHub action, action spin the entire workflow, so you don't even have to look at it. Eventually, when they complete, you will have the merge request um, interaction conversation page with whichever metric reports you want. In our case, what we do is we always show the difference in metrics to show that our model is performing. And then you can put you know, all these uh, nice fancy graphs that we, with all these colors that the business always love. And, uh, and this actually helped me very much because now whenever my boss asks me for performance metrics or whether or not what I'm doing makes sense, I just give him the link to the pull request and he sees all the metrics. He sees the quantitative results. He sees all the calibrations of the models. He sees um, all the plot with the feature importance and so on and so forth. Now, I could have included some images here, but I didn't because in our particular case, it's just a bunch of numerical financial data, so they don't look very sexy. But if you go on the internet, in particular on the readme page of CML, you will find all these very nice plots with, uh, um, with a lot of colors, so you can actually understand that this is very, very useful. And this is one of the features that, um, that helped us very much in just having very smooth communication also outside our team. So in a nutshell, again, I apologize if initially you guys didn't see the slide, so probably you missed some, uh, some meme or some images, but I hope that, um, that my conversation was clear enough. I have a short summary here so that we can just go through the steps that I showed you. First of all, CML gives you the opportunity to deploy runners on whichever cloud services you want to use. In our particular case, we are making use of AWS EC2 instances. You have to pass, of course, some repository secrets and some SSH credentials, but I hope that if you have the slides deck, you can just copy and paste from what I've done, and this should just be working for you. Um, and then I showed you how to set up um, Python virtual environments and whichever other package manager you want to use. In our case, we are using ppenv. Um, but um, the key point is that you can specify explicitly the Python version you want to use. And eventually, all the DVC stuff, you can DVC pool, you can DVC repro, you can show the metrics. And the key point of all of this is that finally, the data scientist can, so, so this sentence here is, is very important. Because what I want to emphasize is that this gives me the opportunity to just do my data science without having to worry about the whole infrastructure stuff. So this is helping me abstract away the entire time that I have to spend, not every day, but quite often in going to the instances, spinning the app, checking the results. Now I don't have to do this any longer because this is taken care of. So I can just concentrate on the machine learning and on the data science and do what I like to do. And this is the important part that, that, part that I want to emphasize. Pros and cons. Um, again, uh, just a brief summary. Of course, we all love DFC. So pros, this is awesome. <laughs> there is nothing to say. But uh, on a more serious note, um, as I said, this abstracts away the entire process of having to train models, of having to create instances. The grammar is straightforward because this is just a YAML file and the grammar in general of the GitHub Actions is very, very easy. There isn't really anything that you need to learn or there is no possibility to you to do any 
bug or code mistakes because there is no grammar. It's just indicating the environment variables, the GitHub actions you want to um, you want to use, and that's it. Also, of course, metric reports and plots are available when you open a merge request. So you can literally just give the link to your supervisor or to your boss or to uh, the sales team uh, because they don't really understand the quantitative results. They just want to see the plot. So you give them the link and they are sorted. And last but not the least, I found out that um, GitHub has a um, very nice command line interface. And this integrates very well with the workflows and the GitHub Actions. You can access all the logs, you can access all the properties, and you can access all the results of the um, CML workflows by using the GitHub command line interface. There is a little thing that I want to add here, and maybe at the end of the meeting, because I don't want to steal too much time. Um, I wrote a GitHub extension for this command line interface that allows you to directly browse the logs of the runs without having to invoke any grammar. So you can do this in one line of code, and maybe I can share this later because it can be useful to you guys who are also using um, GitHub Actions workflows and very often have to debug logs and look for particular um, regex patterns into um, the logs and so on. The cons. Um, I indicated two cons here. To be honest, I don't think there are any cons with the, with the framework itself. What can happen is that, uh, at least in my case, in my experience, our company already has an engineering infrastructure that uses Jenkins, and they may not be wanting to duplicate model builds, model runs, and all the rest. I'm not saying that CML is a duplicate of Jenkins. I'm, I'm just saying that you may be facing this type of discussions in your company when you do this, because this is what happens to us. I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing. I'm just saying these are possible cons that may happen when you work, of course, in an organization where there are engineering costs that you have to take into account and other people doing the work and so on and so forth. And um, that's all folks uh, from my side. So, um, I hope that the slides will be made available um, so that you can literally just reach out to the links that I shared, copy and paste the code. And apologies again for the initial part. I didn't realize that the tech wasn't browsing along. So um, no worries. Thank you so much. And please let, let's start questions, but the slides are in the chat. So everybody has access to the slides. So they'll be able to catch those ones that we missed in the beginning. But does anyone have any questions for Gennaro? Yeah, thanks so much. It was a great presentation. Um, I guess I could I could say something to, to your point about Jenkins. We we are currently looking to doing a proper formal release for the Terraform stuff that is behind the CML runners. So we might be moving towards potentially supporting things like Jenkins. Mm -hmm. um, so right now we're we're mostly focusing on GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket in terms of CI/CD. But yeah, it's definitely on our radar to to be more friendly to other use cases. Yeah, I guess, Gennaro, thanks, it was awesome. Um, I guess I'd just like to hear if you have any ideas on the the um, secrets and configuring all that stuff, because that does tend to be, like that's the first thing that you really have to get set up on any project. And with both DVC and CML, it's like the cost of the flexibility of providing, of working with you know lots of different backends and being able to, um, work with your own infrastructure is that it's hard to sort of cover every use case there, right? Um, so yeah, if you or anyone else has uh, suggestions on how we can make that easier for you, let us so, know. Um, yeah, this is an interesting question because first of all, we, one needs to understand that you just can't, can't do without the secrets. So the question is, how can you make the passing of the secrets easier so that you don't have to click left and right? The way I would do it is I would create a configuration file somewhere that integrates or that is being called by the CML.yaml so that you don't have to introduce these secrets at the level of repository secrets. Now, I'm not entirely sure whether this is possible. There may be some GitHub uh, dependencies around. So eventually, perhaps you must still do the way you currently do. But uh, my opinion is that it can be made easier by just introducing 
an additional YAML file with configuration. And then this additional configuration file is invoked by the main uh, workflow file. Yeah. So I guess you'd still have to have your secrets uh, stored in the appropriate places, but then you could maybe configure uh, where to find those. Yes. So uh, having secrets isn't the problem. The problem is that different secrets, for example, SSH access or GitHub token, they, you usually have to write them and parse them in different places. So if you had them all in the same place, this would already take away most of the stress of having to think about it. Um, I think but, uh, for some of that too, um, depending on how you have that set up for the like code cloning, you can use the runner's token for accessing the repo. Um, I'm pretty sure that like the personal access token is required so that CML can register the self-hosted runner on your account. Mm -hmm. But otherwise it's using the, the runner generated token to access the repository. Okay, okay. I see, I see. Cool. Any other questions? And Daniel, did I see a DV in the blurry background back there? It is. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I spotted it. <laughs> cool. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this product update video, please like and subscribe. Thanks, DV. And feel free to post comments and questions below. On our YouTube channel, we share videos on product updates, tutorials, and how members of our community use our tools as they solve problems in their domains spanning a wide variety of fields in the machine learning and AI space. Don't miss out on any of it. See the description below to find links in the docs for our tools. They are an excellent resource for getting started. Also visit our blog where you can find tutorials on our tools as well as product and company news. Join our Discord server to get support help others grappling with the same issues as you, connect with other like-minded folks, and discuss our tools or other topics in the MLOps space. It's a great way to learn and get to know others worldwide who share your interests. We also have a job channel where you can find relevant job opportunities in the space. Finally, if you're really serious about taking your MLOps skills to the next level, we offer a free online course that is designed to help you understand the iterative philosophy and achieve your MLOps goals. Our mission at Iterative is to deliver the best developer experience for machine learning teams by developing an ecosystem of open modular ML tools. Thanks for making it to the end. Devi and I will see you in the next video.